Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Gropp, and I am the Interim Co-Executive Director of the American Institute of Biological Sciences, and I want to welcome everyone to, today, to today's program, um, which is a preview of some of the issues that, that we think are going to be um, resonant and, and timely this year as um, Congress and the White House and other sectors all um, endeavor to address various issues of science policy. So this is one of our monthly programs that are part of our, our Leadership in Biology talk series, which is an ongoing effort that we have to bring experts, knowledge, and, and content to the broader community. So we welcome you to today's program, encourage you to um, participate in future programs. If you have ideas for programs, please reach out to us. Again, for those of you on the participating in today's program who are already AIBS members, we, we thank you very much. Your support is part of what makes these programs uh, possible. And if you're not a member, we hope that you'll um, think about joining with us in the future as we work together to advance biology for the benefit of science as well as society. So with that, I will turn the program over to Julie Plokovich Carr, and thank you again. Well, thank you uh, all for, for joining us this afternoon. Um, I think it's appropriate at the start of the, the new year to be kind of looking ahead to what we might be uh, expecting from uh, our members of Congress and the White House uh, this year in terms of federal science policy. Uh, we are just a few days into the second session of the 114th Congress. So in many ways, what we might expect to happen in 2016 um, could be a continuation of issues that arose uh, in the past year during the first session of this Congress. During uh, my talk today, um, I'll address a few factors that uh, may influence federal actions that could take place this year, um, and then delve into some of the specifics for um, what science policy issues we might see on the horizon. So probably one of the biggest factors that uh, will influence um, the political landscape this year in terms of science policy is the fact that it is an election year. Um, of course, it's not just the presidential elections that are going to be taking place this November, uh, but also the fact that uh, there will be congressional elections. All of the seats in the House and uh, one third of the seats in the Senate um, are up for election this November as well. And this certainly has an, an influence um, in terms of what the, the session of Congress will look like, both um, in terms of the duration of the session. Um, as is typical for an election year, we're looking at a much shorter legislative calendar this year. Um, as you can see, the House and Senate are expected to be in session for um, many less days this year than they were last year, um, which is also just kind of a, a continuation of a, a longer term, multi-year trend of having shorter sessions, um, or excuse me, shorter, uh, lesser number of days in session um, as the years go by. Uh, so not only will Congress be on break in August as is uh, their typical practice, um, but both chambers will be out for half of July to accommodate the presidential, um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I just forgot the word, the, um, the conventions, excuse me. Um, in addition, the House will be on break uh, for all of the month of October, so the weeks leading up to uh, the election, and the Senate also plans to be out for most of October. So j just by way of uh, this abbreviated calendar, we're going to have less time for lawmakers to address issues this year. Then there's also the matter of what uh, legislative items come forward and actually are moving through Congress. Um, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell uh, recently told a reporter um, quite candidly that uh, it's the issues that are going to come forward in the Senate are in large part going to be dictated by the competitive races in the Senate. Um, there are a number of incumbent uh, senators who are Republicans um, who are facing tough re-election bids in states like New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, and Illinois. So certainly the majority is going to be looking to retain their 
majority in the Senate um, and not wanting to put their vulnerable members um, in positions um, of having to, to vote on issues that uh, may not play well back home and may not fare well for their reelection bid. Um, certainly both parties are going to be looking to score political points at well at, at the expense of the other party. Uh, so this certainly means that we're going to see um, politics playing even more of a role, unfortunately, in terms of what issues uh, get floor time in the House and Senate. Um, and as the president uh, recently said, um, that, you know, there's going to be a lot of folks worrying about their primaries, about trying to position themselves relative to presidential candidates. Uh, in regards to, oh, excuse me, um, the other factor at play here is with it being President Obama's final year in office, uh, we can expect to see fewer new initiatives coming forward. Uh, typically by this point in a, a president's term in office, they are looking to secure their legacy and not to keep advancing new initiatives. Um, and certainly tonight's State of the Union address will be a great indicator of uh, what actions that the White House and the executive branch uh, may be taking or focusing on um, over the next year. The White House has already uh, been saying that uh, tonight's address isn't going to lay out a laundry list of policy proposals like past addresses have, but instead uh, be looking to um, some of the issues that will shape our country for generations to come. Now, to the extent that uh, the official guest list of people who sit with uh, the First Lady um, is any indicator of what topics might be addressed in the speech, it is notable that two STEM advocates um, have been invited to sit with the First Lady. Um, this could be indicative of the President uh, talking about science or science education in his address. He certainly has in past years, um, so we, we may be looking for that to happen again tonight. So turning to uh, the House, uh, with uh, Paul Ryan's um, recent ascension to the position of Speaker of the House, uh, we're still seeing how things are going to play out there. I think uh, Speaker Ryan is trying to differentiate himself from his predecessor, John Boehner, in how he leads the House and how he leads his caucus. And uh, he recently... Um, said that uh, a lot of what his priorities are for 2016 are going to be determined by uh, the Republican caucus in the House. Um, he said it's going to be a, a bottom-up collaborative process with all of our members contributing to the process. Now, the uh, Republicans in both the House and Senate are actually going to be having a joint retreat um, later this week, and uh, we could be looking for what comes out of that meeting as um, potential messaging as what topics uh, the majority party plans to address during this year. But there certainly are a lot of, uh, calling them leftovers or topics that uh, were being debated um, towards the end of 2015 that did not get um, finished or especially even though there were a number of um, major pieces of legislation that did get wrapped up in December, but certainly everything from national security and gun control um, to defunding Planned Parenthood um, and addressing climate change are some of the big topics that were out there and we're starting to get some traction in, in the various parties um, that we might see come back. Uh, again, because of the dynamics of it being an election year, I think we can expect to see a lot of debate on these topics, but perhaps not very much to happen or for a bill to say move through one chamber, but not the other. So turning uh, now to uh, some specific topics in science policy, I think the one that we have uh, the most certainty about how it might play out this year is in terms of actual funding opportunities for research programs. And that's because uh, lawmakers did finalize uh, fiscal year 2016 um, appropriations. They did a, a passed a massive spending package and it was the omnibus in December before taking their break for the winter holidays. And that omnibus did include increased funding for most science programs. Um, and I'll run through a few here. Um, 
The National Institutes of Health is going to receive an extra $2 billion as compared to the 2015 spending level. And Congress uh, did direct a, a significant portion of that increase um, to a few initiatives, including research on Alzheimer's disease, uh, the President's Precision Medicine Initiative, which has to do with developing personalized medicine, the President's Brain Initiative, um, which has been a, a multi-year effort at this point um, to better understand human cognition um, and neuroscience. And uh, lastly, to combating antimicrobial resistance. This was uh, one issue that came forward in the President's budget request for 2016 that we'll see reappear in some other agencies as well. Um, I, I think the administration is hoping that there are a number of science programs that can make an impact in terms of our understanding of microbial resistance to um, antibiotics. At the National Science Foundation, uh, they will be expecting a $119 million increase. $100 million of that is uh, specified to go to the research and related activities account. Um, in keeping with past practice, Congress um, ultimately is allowing for that allocation among NSF's research directorates to be determined by the agency, uh, with the exception of uh, social sciences um, directorate. Uh, Congress did cap the amount of funding that SBE can receive um, at no more than the 2015 enacted level. Um, so NSF could fund it anywhere up to that funding level. The rest of the directorates, it, it's at NSF's discretion, the levels that, that they get funded at. Um, so although we don't know uh, at this point exactly where NSF plans to put that money or how to allocate it, if their budget request uh, to Congress that was released uh, last spring is any indication, a couple of the areas within the bio directorate that we might see increases are in terms of neuroscience research, and then also the interdisciplinary um, nexus of food, energy, and water systems initiative, which was a new initiative proposed in the 2016 budget that goes across a number of research directorates. At the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, within their ecosystems activity, uh, Congress provided uh, an additional $100 million um, and directed for that money to be equally split between um, research efforts on white nose syndrome in bats, as well as uh, research on new and emerging invasive species. At the USDA uh, Agriculture and Food Research Initiative, AFRI, which is USDA's Competitive Extramural Grants Program, um, there will be an additional $25 million available uh, for that program. And although lawmakers did not specify how uh, that money should be spent within the AFRI program. Um, the budget request for 2016 for the agency um, did have a few new initiatives, uh, including more research on pollinator health and on uh, microbial resistance to antibiotics. The Department of Energy's Biological and Environmental Research Program will receive an additional $17 million and again, there aren't specifics provided in the omnibus, but the budget request for the agency highlighted a few areas of where they were looking for increased funding, including genomic science, um, three bioenergy research centers, and on uh, research to understand interdisciplinaries among water, energy, and climate change. And the last program I'll highlight is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research. Uh, that program uh, will receive an additional $29 million for um, operations, and uh, Congress did provide some specifics on that uh, and is directing increases for a number of line items within the budget, uh, including ocean exploration, research on ocean acidification, ocean observation and monitoring, the marine aquaculture program, and the national uh, sea grant program. So looking ahead to 2017 funding, uh, even though we just got through the pr process for 2016, not even a month ago, uh, 
eyes are ahead at this point to February 9th, when President Obama will release his final budget request to Congress. Um, and in many ways, um, the discussion and debate over the 2017 numbers should go a little more smoothly than 2016 did um, in that the budget deal that lawmakers reached back around Halloween um, already sets the top line number for uh, spending this year and they've agreed that uh, the federal budget will be 1.07 trillion dollars in 2017 that's a 30 million or excuse me billion dollar increase and they've already agreed that that additional funding is going to be equally divided between defense and non-defense uh, programs. So the, the release of the president's budget request uh, next month is just the first step uh, in the process. Congress will um, be holding hearings with the various agencies and then ultimately drafting 12 appropriations bills um, that will collectively fund the government. Um, the goal is to finish uh, all of these appropriations by October 1st when fiscal year 2017 begins. Um, now, congressional leadership in both parties have been saying that it's a priority for them to return to quote unquote regular order, uh, which is to move the 12 appropriations bills individually rather than having this massive spending package at the end of the fiscal year or even into the, the, the new fiscal year. Um, and it's certainly an ambitious goal. Uh, that has not been the norm uh, for the last several decades, um, although it is possible that they will be able to move perhaps a few of the bills that are less contentious. Um, kind of regardless of how the process plays out, um, I think we can be um, somewhat optimistic about how science funding might fare in that um, science is one of those areas that has done historically well. Um, even in recent years with sequestration, there have been certain programs like the National Science Foundation that have seen budget increases uh, while at the same time other programs are being flat funded or cut. Um, one of the issues that has been a sticking point in recent years has to do with policy writers. Um, and that's because within these 12 um, bills that collectively fund the government, um, there isn't one for science. You have a whole hodgepodge of agencies that can be in one particular bill. For instance, uh, the bill that funds NSF also funds the Departments of Commerce and Justice and also includes NASA. So uh, there could be a policy debate around um, community policing that holds up a bill uh, that has nothing to do with NSF, but still is impacting how that bill progresses. Um, a, an area where we have seen a lot of contention in, in recent years has been the Interior and Environment Appropriations Bill. Um, that bill funds both the Department of Interior and the Environmental Protection Agency, among other programs. And there has been a lot of debate around uh, listing of endangered species, funding for climate change programs, and those sorts of things that are, have often held up the ability of that bill to progress. So moving on uh, to another topic, I think it's likely that uh, efforts to reauthorize the America Competes Act um, will continue. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, the Competes Act was enacted uh, back in 2007, and it's a law that basically set funding and policy direction for NSF, the Department of Energy's Office of Science, and the laboratories at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, the House did pass a bill um, last summer, uh, and the Senate has been working towards drafting its own legislation. Um, the Senate has made clear that they are not using the House bill as a starting point, um, which I think the scientific community sees as, uh, as a good thing. Um, but uh, progress to date has not been terribly public. Uh, the Senate has held a handful, the Senate Commerce Committee has hand, uh, held a handful of roundtables um, in order to determine what should be in their version of the bill. Um, While there's likely to be uh, agreement between the House and Senate um, on a few areas that come, fall within the jurisdiction of the, the Competes Act, for instance, trying to reduce regulations on federal research, 
there's likely to be a number of sticking points that could impede the ability of the two chambers to actually um, agree on legislation that could pass both chambers. Um, I'll highlight a few of those. Uh, one is that uh, the, the funding levels, just kind of how aspirational should uh, the Competes Act be. Uh, there tends to be pressure from the Democrats to, to go bigger uh, and for Republicans to not set as high of levels, um, as well as a debate over how long the bill should encompass. Should it set uh, funding goals for two years, or three years, or five years? Um, and another issue around funding is specificity. As I mentioned during the discussion of the, the 2016 appropriations, uh, there was movement in the House this year that was somewhat successful uh, to try to limit the amount of funding for social science and climate research. And uh, the House bill um, does actually set funding levels for specific NSF directorates. Um, that is not something that we're anticipating in a Senate bill, uh, but that could be a big point of disagreement between the chambers. And uh, another issue has to do with the um, uh, basically a new restriction on the types of grants that NSF could fund. Um, there's language in the House bill that would require that any funding the agency provides would have to be certified as, quote, in the national interest and would have to meet um, I think one of six criteria to, to meet that, whether it's in terms of national security um, or global competitiveness or, or a few others. Another piece of legislation that has been um, progressing, although somewhat slowly, is uh, overhaul of the Toxic Substances Control Act, TSCA. Um, this is a law that's been on the books for a number of decades. It basically regulates the testing and introduction of new chemicals. Um, the EPA administers the program, but there's been a number of questions about the efficacy of the law and its ability to protect consumers. There uh, are two bills out there that are pending a House and a Senate bill um, that have each passed their, their own chamber, um, but there are significant differences in the approaches that the bills take, and um, so far there has not been any uh, movement to conferencing those bills, uh, although I'm starting to see some things in the news here in the last couple of days that, that may be forthcoming. Um, in the meantime, the administration has actually created a new prize that they've just announced. Um, they're offering uh, $1 million in, in um, a prize competition for teams that can create a new way to more accurately screen chemicals um, once they've been metabolized by the human body. And the goal here is to uh, try to come up with new assays that are, are quick, can be done en masse, and are more accurate in terms of determining how compounds get broken down by the body and what the implications may be uh, for human health. So in regards to climate change, of course, with uh, the historic agreement reached in Paris last month, um, I think there are many people who are eager to see some progress on that front. And uh, the president has uh, said that he is prepared to act on his own rather than going to the Senate to ratify a treaty um, and rather that he could take executive actions in order to fulfill uh, the pledges that the U.S. made as part of that accord. Uh, so, for instance, doing additional funding into clean energy research and development or providing grants for climate adaptation in developing countries. Um, there have not been uh, a lot of specifics released yet from the administration, um, but uh, there certainly would be a number of options that they have in their toolbox in terms of actions that they could take. Um, however, there are members of Congress that um, disagree and don't think that it's appropriate um, or perhaps even legal for what the president is proposing to do. They think that the Senate needs to have a say in this, given that this is an international matter that typically would have to be ratified as a treaty. Uh, and there already have been several resolutions that have been uh, introduced that are critical of the president's actions. Um, uh, another 
tact that Congress could take is to block funding for any of these programs um, since Congress um, does receive the president's budget request each year, but then gets to, um, you know, draft the bills as they see fit. Uh, of course, the president ultimately has to sign or, or veto those bills, but um, certainly that would be one option um, for members who would be looking to block implementation on the U.S.'s part in terms of the international climate deal. Um, in terms of STEM education, um, in many ways, we probably have seen uh, the most action that's going to take place on this issue um, during 2015, and that's because uh, lawmakers did enact um, a rewrite of the No Child Left Behind Act, um, which did include provisions uh, related to science education. Um, notably, that law is going to create a STEM Master Teacher Corps. Um, which will uh, train and encourage teachers that have uh, more scientific knowledge or background um, in order to be real leaders in their schools and to share knowledge amongst themselves and with other educators. Uh, that law also is, is going to include some new opportunities for STEM programs that reach underrepresented um, groups and low-income students. So it's likely that whatever other policy issues actually have a chance of, of moving through Congress around STEM education, um, probably the competes reauthorization bill is going to be the best opportunity for that to happen. Um, the House bill did include a, a section on STEM education, in particular in regards to uh, the National Science Foundation, um, to be determined what the Senate's going to do in that regard. So the last issue that I wanted to highlight is uh, congressional oversight of science programs. Um, in, of course, in addition to uh, appropriating funding, Congress has an important role in terms of oversight of the executive branch. And there have been um, several science programs that have been, you could say, in the crosshairs uh, of certain science uh, congressional committees in the last year or so, um, and actually many facets of NSF's management has been subject to hearings by the House Science Committee in the past year. Um, everything from NSF's use of temporary personnel known as rotators to their oversight and um, perceived or perhaps real uh, lack of restrictions on management fees for certain types of awards that they make. Um, in that regard, the, the National Ecological Observatory Network has been one subject um, of uh, scrutiny by the House Science Committee. Um, and actually, as I think a result of that oversight, NSF made the announcement just a few weeks ago that they were gonna be changing the management of uh, NEON um, here in the near future. Uh, another topic that has been of kind of ongoing congressional interest is the procurement of uh, climate and weather satellites by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, those programs are long overdue and very much over budget, um, so continue to, to gain a lot of um, interest and oversight from Congress. And lastly, I'll mention that there are some members of Congress who have been um, producing quote unquote waste books or, or something of comparable name um, where they have been placing a lot of scrutiny on individual um, federal programs and in many cases, individual research grants. So actually, uh, just in the last month, we saw the release of I think um, three or four more of these types of books by individual lawmakers um, and we have definitely seen an increasing trend there of where particular research grants are um, being subjected to intense scrutiny um, by members of Congress. So I, I think that trend, unfortunately, is going to continue here in the near term. So before we go to the Q&A session, um, I will just highlight a few opportunities for, for people who are, um, have an ongoing interest in science policy and would like to take advantage of some of the other programs offered by AIBS. Um, first, I just want to put a plug in for the webinar I will be giving next month on February 25th. That'll be a, a deeper dive into the president's budget request for 2017. 
uh, that event is free. You are welcome to join us and uh, you can, um, from the AIBS homepage, AIBS.org, uh, find a link to register for that event if you've not already done so. I would also encourage you to, describe, to, to subscribe to the AIBS Public Policy Report. That's a free publication. We send out that newsletter every other week. It's a great way to stay informed in terms of what's happening in terms of science policy um, and other issues that might be of interest to biologists. And lastly, our Legislative Action Center is a great uh, one-stop shop for tools and resources for people who are interested in engaging in science policy. And that's policy.aibs.org. So with that, I am happy to open this up to questions. Um, Diane, will people be able to unmute themselves? So what we're suggesting to do is if you have a question to just go ahead and chat um, your question to the chat box so we don't have it in case multiple people have questions at the same time. So on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little chat box. Um, if you wanna go ahead and type in your question and, and um, I can relay those questions to Julie. Um, so. Great. So I do have a question, um, perhaps a little, perhaps a bit OT, but does AIBS plan on joining publicizing uh, sciencedebate.org? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it, I would say yes. Uh, in past years, we certainly have uh, highlighted the efforts of that group, um, and I think I belonged as well, uh, but certainly covering that through the policy report, I can actually recall um, a couple of years ago, we were encouraging people to attend um, town hall meetings that their members of Congress were hosting and uh, promoted some of the questions um, that were available through that website as potential questions that someone might ask um, at that town hall meeting. Great, thanks Julie. Um, does anybody else have any other additional questions? Give it a couple minutes for people to type in um, their questions. Let's see. And if you know, if you think of any questions after the fact, feel free. I, I don't know if Julie, if you're going to give your email address out, but everybody has my email. Oh, but I do have a question. Here we go. All right. <laughs> Should scientists focus more on presidential race or legislative races? I realize both are important, but Congress is writing the laws. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, in a lot of ways, it depends on what uh, congressional district you live in and how competitive that race may be versus um, the presidential race in your state. Um, I think if people are interested in engaging on kind of either of those levels, our Legislative Action Center is a, is a great way to get involved. I think we'll soon be launching a tool here where you'll be able to send a letter to political candidates who are not currently office holders. So if you wanted to get in touch um, with any of the, the candidates um, for either of those, those races, um, you'll be able to do that soon through our Legislative Action Center. I have another question. Um, okay, how does someone assess whether a science project is in, nat in national interest? Uh, let me provide a little bit more background on that particular issue. Um, so although the House has now passed a bill, um, hasn't moved yet in the Senate, but requiring um, bills, or grants funded by NSF to be in the national interest, at the same time, NSF has actually been moving in this direction as well. Um, they have not yet, uh, I don't think, released the guidance to um, their awardees about this, but really it's gonna be on NSF's and in terms of making that determination. Um, I, from what I recall, um, yeah, the, the, the six areas, um, I think it was national security, um, US economic competitiveness. Um, th there was one that was kind of a catch all, you could say for NSF that was around uh, innovation and you know broadening the, frontiers of our knowledge or, or something like that. Um, so the, the six areas are pretty broad. Um, NSF 
when they do finalize um, their policy end of it, regardless of what happens with that legislation, I imagine we'll be putting out more directions um, to a their awardees about how things comply. I would say at this point, um, people who are applying for funds um, from NSF, you know, there isn't any new requirements there. And I think that the agency really will broadcast what changes um, are coming or, or once they're in place. Great, thanks. Um, this is from Charles. Will AIBS endorse a presidential campaign in the candidate, sorry, in the primary or general election? So as a scientific society, um, we have not gotten involved um, at that level. Really, our, we feel like our role is more in terms of educating um, lawmakers or people who are running for office about um, what the issues are. In addition, there are some restrictions because we are a nonprofit entity um, under the IRS regulations in terms of how we can engage in politics and uh, versus policy. So certainly we're, we're not getting involved kind of in on the political end of things. We're looking more at advancing um, issues uh, in policy and making sure that um, decision makers are able to make good decisions based on good science. Great, thanks. Are efforts being made through this group or others to unite researchers to speak on policy issues such as ocean acidification research? If so, are these efforts coordinated in a regional or national le level? So ARBS works with uh, a number of other scientific organizations. Um, we belong to coalitions around everything from you know, funding for the National Science Foundation to climate science. And uh, we definitely have been working with other scientific organizations and entities to try to advance some of those. Um, in regards to oceans, um, I do believe that there is a coalition that uh, works around that issue, but it's mainly from the perspective of the work that NOAA does. Um, but certainly we're always kind of keeping an eye on what other groups are doing and, and seeing where we can be helpful and what's of interest to our member organizations and individuals. Great, thanks. I believe that might be the last question I have so far. Um, any other further questions? Well, maybe while we, we give it a minute for to see if there's any more questions, um, I will uh, mention that since uh, Diane did record today's webinar, we will be posting this on the IBS website for a period of time. If you wanted to go back and uh, to refer back to anything or to let a colleague know about it, um, I think we can send out an email to, to everybody uh, who had registered for today's event, we're providing a link to, 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 to today's presentation. I think we're, I think that's the end of the questions, Julie. All right. Well, great. Um, if anyone has anything that they think of afterwards, um, I'll make sure that the, the email go, that goes out um, with the link to the webinar video includes my email address. People are uh, welcome to follow up with me individually afterwards. Um, and I just want to thank you all again for, for joining today's webinar. Um, our next webinar in this series is going to be on evaluating merit review, predictive validity of peer review scores, which is going to be held on February 18th. The presenter will be Michael Lauer, Deputy Director for Extramural Research at the National Institutes of Health. And if you visit our website, AIBS.org, um, you can register for that webinar or any of the other ones that are coming up in this series. And I'd also like to thank all of our individual and organizational members for their support. Without them, we would not be able to provide these informative webinars. And if you're not yet a member of AIBS, please consider joining us to enjoy all the benefits of an AIBS membership and to help bring biology to life. Thank you all again.